Perfect. So yeah, I'm going to be talking about uh, how Zalando accelerates warehouse operations with neural networks. So it's a little bit different than uh, most neural network talks where you um, talk about mainly image recognition or speak re speech recognition, but this is warehouse optimization. And not data warehouse optimization, but like the real warehouse. Um, so I'm gonna start off and talk about the picker routing problem. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the order batching problem. So these are two problems that you have in warehouse retail, retail warehouse operation, operations, um, and these can be nicely solved with uh, neural networks. But first, we've gotta talk about the problem to understand it. Then we'll get to the neural network solution. Um, and I'd just like to give a shout out to Roland Feugraff and Sebastian Heinz. Uh, I collaborated with them, but unfortunately they couldn't be here today. So the retail warehouse, it looks uh, much like the, uh, the Tesco supermarkets that we were talking about and that you want to uh, avoid apparently, at least in the Netherlands, because it's just a uh, huge uh, rows and aisles full of uh, shoes, uh, full of boxes, um, full of earrings, shirts, dresses, everything that you want to buy. And the problem is, is that you've got a bunch of locations in this warehouse that uh, our pickers have to visit. So what they do is they, uh, they start off uh, down here at the depot, and then they move through the warehouse, go into all these blue locations, collect the articles, and then bring, them, bring the articles back to the depot, drop it off, and do the same thing again. So basically, they're spending their entire day at, de at Tesco just going there, checking out, going there again. It's a little bit easier to think of it in this sort of schematic representation where you've got this sort of 2D thing, but you can, uh, you can fairly clearly see how this, uh, this maps to this. Uh, so what does this look like in detail? Start off at the depot, uh, go to the first pick, pick it, go to the second pick, pick it, and sort of work your way through the, uh, through the warehouse. So clearly, if you can come up with, uh, with, with something, with a route that's optimal, um, you'll save money, you'll drive efficiency, you'll be able to pass the savings on to the customers. And so th that was the goal of our project. And it's sort of a, uh, it's sort of a traveling salesman type, uh, type thing. But the trick is, is instead of uh, traveling through middle, middle Europe or wherever this traveling salesman uh, used to travel through, we travel through this rope ladder um, layout. And so the rope ladder layout is very nice and it makes it to where we can have our little copy algorithm. So the copy algorithm is called the optimal cart pick and it's able to calculate the best way to move through the warehouse um, and also the best way to move the cart. Because the cart that the guy is, uh, is taking is rather big, it can hold a lot of stuff, but it's a little bit hard to wield and so it's good to give the guy tips where to leave the cart, where to bring it with him. Um, and so this tells us the optimal way to move through the warehouse. Uh, it has a complexity that's linear in the number of aisles. So that means that, uh, that, that it, it, it's fast enough for, for, our, uh, for, for just telling the warehouse worker where to go. But unfortunately, it still has a runtime uh, run of about one second. So it's still too slow for the next application. And so the next application is called the, um, the order batching problem. So basically, we can think about this in, in a very simple way. We have uh, in different orders, so we've got a bunch of different customers, they've uh, ordered a bunch of different things, and so each order has multiple items. You know, you have, uh, you have your dress, and then you have your heels to go with it, and we want, to, uh, we want to split these orders into different pick tours, so that not one worker is uh, getting all the items out of the warehouse, but the work is spread between different workers, spread between different pick tours, and uh, the work can actually get done. So try and uh, basically have this little bar bipartite graph formulation where we uh, assign every order to one pick list and, uh, and do it like this. And so we can't, it's important to point out here in the simplified setting that we can't assign one order to multiple pick lists. So if we have like the, the, the shoe and the dress order, okay, we can't, uh, we can't have picker number one um, pick the shoe and picker number two pick the dress because maybe picker number one is gonna work in the morning and picker number two is going to work in the afternoon 
and then there's no way to really bring the stuff together. So the, the same guy's got to do the whole order in this simplified setting. And so, and so what happens, and so this is, this is basically the, this is, this is the slide that I'm going to dwell on the longest, and it's sort of important to understand. Um, so what happens here is, is if we've got this example where we've got uh, 10 different orders, and each order has two items, and we want to split it between two pick lists, we can, we can split it in sort of a random way. And so here we see a random split. And so this warehouse on the left, this graph on the left, this is the first um, pick tour. This one on the right is the second pick tour. Each of these uh, circles represents an item that needs to be picked from the warehouse. And if the circle is, uh, is somehow, somehow filled in, is dark, like this or like this, that means that this guy is picked in this pick tour. And if it's light, it means it's picked in the other pick tour. So you see that each, uh, each, of the tour has, uh, each of the tours has 20 circles for the 20 different items. And um, 10 are sort of light, 10 are sort of dark. The color represents um, the order it belongs to. So for example, here, these two right here, they've got the same color. And so that means they belong to the same order. So the two items belong to the same order. So you have to pick them together. Right? And so then you've got like basically this sort of optimization problem of, OK, how do we put the different orders in the two different pick lists so that the guy doesn't have to walk so far? Right? So, so we can, uh, we can, we can take a, a, a quick break. Um, and if anybody's got any questions on this graph, uh, they, they can ask them. Because I know it's a little, it's, it, I've explained it a couple times. And every time, I'm like, it's so hard to understand. Um, so does everybody understand the basic, the basic idea here? All right, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing a good number of nodding heads. So I feel, I feel, I feel good. So what, what's happening here is we've got basically a random split. So we've, we've taken half the orders and given them to one picker, half the orders we've given them to the other picker. And it leads to some, some outrageous inefficiencies. So we see, uh, let's see, where's our, our little, uh, here we go. So we see this guy here, so these two yellow guys out here. All right? um, the, the, picker, the picker in the second tour, he's got to go all the way to the right side of the warehouse and all the way to the back to pick these two, uh, to these two yellow guys. And he's got to do it, even though the first guy, he walked past them. He walked right past these two. You know? He walked past them, and he didn't do anything. He didn't pick them out. And so obviously, if they'd been able to talk to each other, this guy would have been like, hey, man, can you do this for me? And if you do that, then I'll do these red guys over here, because I'm going out there that way anyway. Um, and so it's, it's, not a very, it's not a super efficient process. But, and so, and so for this simple example, we can, we can use some sort of a brute force optimization strategy um, that, uh, that, that gives us these pick tours. And so this ends up being 8.3% uh, being um, uh, less travel distance. And so, so that's a great, great driver of efficiency. But obviously, this is a, uh, this is a, simple, a simple case with only um, 10 orders, each order has two items. We only have one zone in our warehouse. But you can imagine that at Zalando, each warehouse has you know, 16 zones. For the smaller ones, you've got hundreds of thousands of orders of coming in every day. The brute force thing probably won't work. And indeed, even for a slightly larger example with just 40 orders and, and two items, the brute force guy would have a complexity of 7 times 10 to the 10, because it's all exponential, because everything interesting that you want to do somehow ends up being exponential at the end of the day, which is very frustrating. And then if you're already going up against this one second per route thing because the Okapi algorithm is too slow, you're going to wait 2,000 years. And obviously, your customer is going to be frustrated. They will call customer service and ask where their dress and their shoes are. So this is a. Uh, a non-optimal non uh, setting. So what we can do is we can use clever heuristics like simulated annealing to not do everything, but just sort of work our way to the right solution. And we can 
change this one second per pick route to one millisecond per pick route by estimating the route length with neural networks. So estimating the route length with neural networks, how does this, uh, how does this work? So you can, you can imagine that, that our Okapi uh, function is, is sort of this, uh, this really complicated um, function. That basically what it does is it takes, uh, it takes, takes the IL number here, so, so that's uh, the IL number if we, um, if we go back a little bit. We've got, uh, we've got the IL number, so there's IL0, IL1, and it also takes the distance from the depot, and that's a real numbered value, okay? So it takes in different locations, and takes the IL number and the distance from the depot, and that basically tells you what has to be picked. So if you know these, these in tuples of a real and a, and a, uh, and a natural number, then, then it, 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 it takes these guys and it calculates what's the pick distance going to be. And so that's then a, a number in, in the real number space. And if you think about this function a little bit, you realize it's actually a fairly nice and well-behaved function because it's, it's Lipschitz continuous and the real valued arguments. It's uh, piecewise linear in the real valued arguments and it's locally sensitive. So, um, so Lipschitz continuous and piecewise linear, obviously this just means that in the real valued arguments, it, it will never make a large jump, but as you move, as you move your picks back and forth the, uh, in, this, in this aisle, the time that it takes to pick that thing will, will also move back and forth, but not, not too crazily. And the local, locally sensitive thing, this basically means that, um, that the amount of time, the, the, the interactions between the articles is basically sort of local. So if you have two articles, you move them around sort of next to one another, then, then they affect one another. But if you have two articles that are very far apart, you move them around, you can sort of model them as independent articles. They don't have really much of a, a, a dependency with one another. And so, um, and so you can view this, uh, this guy, this function, as something like this, okay? So this is a cross section of this, of this function where we've got a pick list already and we add one more article, all right? And then depending on where we add it, we'll get a different pick, pick uh, length. So if we add it right next to the front cross aisle, okay, then, then the increase in pick length is not very much because the guy, the picker, he was already gonna go past the cross, front cross aisle. Also, sort of there's this weird ravine here. The picker was probably gonna walk down that aisle already. So by adding a pick in that aisle, you're not really going to add any, any, anything to the pick time. But if we add something to this very back end corner over here, obviously the picker is going to have to walk a lot further because he wasn't going to be back there anymore. So we see that this function is a nice Lipschitz continuous function and is locally sensitive and so we can use neural networks to model it. Um, it's the perfect candidate. So our neural network, it looks like this. And basically what we do, and this is also what's interesting about this, uh, this, this application, is we don't, we don't use any customer data or any real world data. We just, we just get our little uh, Okapi, Okapi algorithm running on a bunch of different AWS uh, uh, machines. And it just generates random pick lists, decides how long that pick list is going to be, spits out a million different examples, and then we train the neural network on these million um, uh, generated examples. And so it's a black box optimization strategy. We're just, we're just taking a black box, the Okapi algorithm, we don't know what it does, we don't really care. We just put input in, get the output out, and then we take this input and this output, we put it into the neur neural network, and then get the neural network to learn that function. Um, and we see we're actually pretty accurate. Um, if we, if we, if we uh, calculate the estimated travel time divided by the calculated travel time, we're generally within you know, one to two percent, uh, which, is, which is really good. And we also see that we're a whole, whole, whole lot faster. Um, it used to be that if we, uh, if we have, you know, um, uh, just having the Okapi thing running and we parallelize it over a bunch of different cores, 
of an Intel Xenon E5, um, then we never really get better than 0.3 seconds per, uh, per pick list. But on the same CPU, on the same CPU, if we just use the neural network approach, we get down to you know, milliseconds. So obviously it's a huge boost. It makes it to where we can try out lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of different pick lists um, and see which ones are going to be the most optimal combination for the picker to walk. Uh, and so, so then the question is, and so this works, it's really good, we're really happy. Um, and, and so then the question is, is, okay, we've got something, it works, it's going well, what's, what's the next step? What's the outlook? Um, and the outlook is, uh, is you can sort of see that the order of action problem, it's something like Go, where, where you've got an agent, he's getting a bunch of different orders, he does, and, and he has to decide um, what he wants to do next, which order he wants to give to which picker. And he's sort of playing this game, and he's trying to maximize his reward, or at least minimize his loss, and the loss is, uh, is the amount that the picker has to, has to walk. And so we could use some sort of a reinforcement algorithm to tackle this problem and, and get this agent to, to play the game, play it better, and, and really drive some efficiency. But there's a big but. All this work is just about driving efficiency. And I think that from the last talk, um, we see that data science, it can do so much more. This idea of having an app where you order 30 items in just three minutes, this really is a new paradigm in retail. It's not, it's not just taking an existing business model and somehow, um, and somehow making it slightly more efficient uh, the, way, the way we're doing it. We're just taking, you know, click a little bit and you get your stuff and the, the, the workers walk, you know, 3% less, okay. It's more efficient, it's great, but it's nothing like new, and that's not, that's not the really exciting stuff. The really exciting stuff, and this is what data science really can do, is, uh, is, is create brand new paradigms. And by just focusing on, on existing products and optimizing those, we're really selling ourselves short. And so I don't think we're going to do the uh, reinforcement approach, but we're going to be working on uh, a newer, more exciting things in the future. And uh, I hope you guys come and check out one of my other talks sooner or later. Hope I get invited again, and I'll talk about uh, that next time. So thank you. The slides are online already, um, but I'm sure that they'll be here online too. And I look forward to your questions.